Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Pratap, and I'm the clinical exercise physiologist here in the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. And today we're going to be talking about exercise and its benefits for prostate cancer patients. Now, from the physicians and staff of the Vancouver Prostate Cancer Center, we'd like to say welcome. Uh, support for this initiative has been provided from a number of government and non-government organizations, uh, including the following. We are very grateful for the philanthropic donations made by these uh, individuals to the PCSC program. Now, just a reminder, this is an information session, so if you do have any medical concerns, uh, they should be brought uh, to your uh, doctor. Um, and if you have any specific exercise-related questions, then you can always um, book a session with myself in the clinic, and we can go over uh, any of those questions that you may have. Now, the Prostate uh, Cancer uh, Supportive Care Program is designed to provide supportive care for both uh, patients and their partners from the time of diagnosis onward. So this is both a supportive care program and a research initiative. A set of modules or programs that provide supportive care beyond treating the cancer itself. Most modules in this program include preemptive and educational themes, and patients choose modules of interest. We believe that knowledge is empowering, and education uh, sessions like this one can help uh, answer any questions that you may have, as, as well as uh, relieve any stress that you might be feeling. Now, the, the program uh, is currently comprised of uh, several modules. Uh, the first module is an introduction to prostate cancer and primary treatment options. So if you're looking at just kind of getting a general overview of prostate cancer and some of the therapies, uh, that would be a great module to start with. Uh, module two is managing the impact of prostate cancer treatment on sexual function and intimacy. Um, so if you're dealing with any issues with uh, rectal dysfunction, um, libido uh, issues, then that might be a good module for you to look into. Um, Lifestyle management, um, including exercise and nutrition, is today's module. So obviously today we're going to be speaking on exercise, but if you did have any uh, nutrition-related questions, you're looking at weight management or specific foods that you should be eating based on your treatment, then the nutrition module would also be beneficial for you. Uh, module number four is recognition and management of treatment-related side effects um, of ADT or antigen deprivation therapy. So if you are someone that's on hormone therapy or ADT, and um, you are struggling with some of the side effects or you just have more questions uh, regarding that therapy, then that would be a great module for you to look into. Uh, module number five is the pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy for bladder and bowel concerns. So if you're dealing with any incontinence, um, that would be the module that um, I would highly recommend uh, that you look into. Uh, module number six is counseling services. So if you're dealing with any uh, stress, uh, stressors, high levels of uh, anxiety, um, post-diagnosis or post-treatment or while you're going through treatment, then um, looking into that counseling services module um, would be very beneficial. And uh, finally, we have the, uh, the metastatic uh, disease management uh, module. So if you've uh, had your cancer metastasized to different areas of the body, um, this would be the perfect module um, for you to look into. So everyone uh, is here uh, for today's talk. Um, obviously to discuss some exercise, right? So today's uh, discussion is, is just general. It's a general discussion on the benefits of exercise, current exercise guidelines for prostate cancer patients and using specific exercises to manage treatment side effects. Um, a very broad, very general, right? Um, if you're someone that has um, other underlying uh, health concerns, uh, other uh, underlying health issues, maybe you're on top of some of the prostate cancer history of um, issues with cardiovascular health, um, issues with lung health, maybe you're dealing with musculoskeletal issues, it gets a little bit harder to just um, take the general guidelines. So, um, or if you just have general questions about how you should be exercising based on some of the therapies um, that you're currently on. So doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, exercise clinic uh, would uh, potentially be a better option for you. So in the one-on-one -on -one clinic, um, exercise assessment followed by exercise guidance specific to your personal health history and prostate cancer treatment. So essentially, you come in for a baseline visit, uh, you sit down with myself, we go over your, your medical history, um, not only your prostate uh, cancer history, but as well as um, your other medical history. Based on that information, um, we go, uh, take you through a few exercise tests. Um, we also go over uh, some of your goals, what you're currently doing for exercise, um, if there's any limitations to exercise. And then once we gather all this information, uh, I go ahead and sit down with you and we put together a exercise plan. Okay, so once that plan's put together, we let you follow through with it for a month. After a month, I uh, check in via phone call and kind of see how everything's going. If everything's great, maybe we'll tweak a couple things here or there. Uh, if we're not meeting our goals, then we'll go ahead and uh, address what, um, what needs to be done in order to, to meet those goals. And then we follow up at a three-month, a six-month, and finally a one-year um, 
visit. So this is great because at least um, you get to, uh, or I'm keeping tabs on you uh, in terms of how exercise is going. Uh, if you have any questions regarding exercise, we can always um, you know discuss those in our follow-up appointments. And the goal is to allow you to progress with your exercise and also allow the exercise um, uh, that we go over to help uh, combat maybe some of the side effects you're feeling for treatment, uh, from your treatments, uh, as well as uh, meet any goals uh, specific to exercise that you may have. Now, today's uh, presentation, we're going to cover what is exercise, why you should exercise, uh, how much exercise is recommended, uh, specific exercises to manage uh, and reduce uh, treatment side effects, enhance, um, enhancing health and long-term survival with uh, exercise, and how to get started safely. All right, so uh, let's jump right into it. So what is exercise? So we had uh, a couple graphics going on here. And before we get into exercise, I don't want to get into uh, physical activity first. Okay, so from physical activity, we can see a couple of examples of what uh, some of these individuals are doing, walking the dog, gardening, uh, playing golf, uh, vacuuming. Uh, and essentially, that's what physical activity is, right? Any sort of movement. If I'm not sedentary and I start moving around, right, cleaning my house, um, start gardening, um, walking my dog, anything that's going to allow me to go from a, a sedentary state to a moving state, anything that's going to allow me to go from a resting heart rate to now it being elevated, that would be considered physical activity. So physical activity can be, you know, doing something for two minutes and then taking a break, it can be doing something for 20 minutes and taking a break, not a whole lot of structure around it, but you are moving. Okay. Um, there is a difference though, between physical activity and exercise. So there's a really good definition here about what exercise is. So exercise is any planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement performed to improve or maintain one's physical health. Some examples include walking, swimming, cycling, weight training. So a couple of keywords there. Exercise is planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement in order to maintain one's physical health, right? So it is goal-oriented, right? If we start talking about things like exercise, um, you know, you have to start asking yourself, well, what's the reason that I'm doing some of these things like walking, right? If my goal is to build up aerobic capacity, I'm not going to be able to do that by just going for a two minute walk, uh, you know, twice a week, right? We need to do a little bit more of that. We need to be intentional. We need to be more repetitive, right? You need, if you really want to improve your cardio, you got to be going for those walk most days of the week. Two minutes is not going to be enough, right? We got to start going into, you know, at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes, up to 30 minutes, most days of the week to do that. If you want to improve strength, right? You're not really going to improve strength by just um, walking your dog, right? We have to get you, you know, doing some sort of resistance training, whether that's um, lifting uh, dumbbells, whether that's using your body weight. So <clears throat> that's where the planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement patterns come in, right? Um, depending on what your goal is, um, and maybe the goal is to uh, overcome some of the fatigue that you're feeling from some of the treatments like radiation or, or hormone therapy, right? Again, you're not going to get that by just um, going for a one minute walk, um, every other day, right? You need to be doing a little bit more than that. So there are specifics in terms of how much and how hard you should be pushing yourself, what specifically you should be doing. But I just wanted to get that difference across that physical activity is movement, whereas exercise is goal directed. It's planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movements with, with the, the hopes of, uh, you know, achieving some sort of goal to help with one's physical health. And lastly, we have sedentary behavior. Now we can see obviously sedentary behavior. Some of the examples here are in, sitting in front of a computer, reading a book, um, watching TV. Now, sedentary behavior is, is now seen as the new smoking, right? Uh, the more time you spend si uh, sitting around, uh, the higher risk of all cause mortality um, goes up. So in this next slide here, we see the importance of movement and exercise, right? So we see that sedentary behavior is associated with an elevated risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, type 2 diabetes, um, all-cause mortality, right? So we want to promote as much movement as we can throughout the day. So we have two examples here. We have, let's say this um, example of one in the red is, her name is uh, Sarah. And then we have this example, two gentlemen in the green, let's say his name is Mike. So let's go through their days. So starting with Sarah, uh, you know, she wakes up in the morning, getting ready for work, showering, having breakfast. Her work's about an hour away. She gets in the car. She drives to work. All right. So once she gets to work, uh, not a whole lot of movements going on here. So she's sitting in front of her computer desk. She's eating lunch in front of her computer. Maybe she's getting up to use the bathroom or, you know, go photocopy something. Majority of her day spent sitting here. 
once she's done work, she gets in her car, drives back home for another hour, um, gets home. Ellen DeGeneres is on TV. And um, uh, after that show's done, after having some dinner, she winds down, wakes up and does the same thing again the next day. Now, in terms of exercise, not even exercise, in terms of just physical activity, any sort of movement, how much has Sarah really done? Not a whole lot, right? Maybe other than walking to her car, uh, you know, doing a little bit of walking uh, to and from the bathroom at work, um, and walking to her TV when she gets home, not a whole lot of movement's been done, okay? On the flip side, we look at Mike's day. Mike is lucky enough to live uh, relatively close to work, about 20 minutes away, so he walks to work, okay? Once he uh, uh, gets to work, um, he sits in front of his computer desk. Uh, he attended one of my talks, and he remembered that Nick said, hey, you know, I should try to get up every 45 minutes to an hour. So he does that, right? Instead of sitting for a full hour um, or more than a full hour, he gets up, walks around a little bit, maybe goes and chats with a friend for a couple of minutes, comes back to his desk. When lunchtime hits, um, he's not just sitting in front of his computer desk. Half an hour he spends eating, and the other half he spends going for a walk. Once he gets home, uh, Mike uh, isn't in front of the TV. He decides to go for a bike ride, uh, comes home, has some dinner. After dinner, he works on a woodworking project. And then after that, he uh, right before bed, he decides to take his dog for a walk. Now, huge contrast here, right? We see that Sarah hasn't done uh, a whole lot of physical activity throughout the day, whereas Mike is doing uh, quite a bit of activity, okay? And so <clears throat> this is where it becomes important in terms of how your body adapts, okay? Your body adapts uh, to it, basically what you put on it. So if you start to adapt this rest strategy of not doing a whole lot of movement, your body will be like, hey, you know what? You're not using these muscles. Um, you're not really moving around too much. Why should we keep them around, right? Because muscles are very metabolically demanding um, to, to keep functioning. Uh, and so that's when we start undergoing what we call atrophy or, or loss of muscle mass. And so that's when you're going to start to become weaker. Um, that's when you might start to notice that, you know, going upstairs, or uh, going for walks, you feel a lot more tired, a lot easier, um, which is obviously what we're trying to avoid, right? Uh, so what we need to do instead is add in what we call these exercise breaks or exercise snacks throughout the day. And what that basically means is every hour, uh, setting either a timer or, or just mentally checking with yourself and saying, hey, you know, I've been sitting for just about an hour. Uh, I need to get up and do some sort of movement, okay? And, and that can be anything. That can be literally getting up out of your seat uh, at home um, and walking back and forth from your kitchen to your living room uh, for a couple minutes. Uh, it can be uh, during a commercial break, sitting and standing 10 times in your chair. Uh, it can be going over to a wall and doing push ups um, uh, at work after 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you can be walking out of your office to the uh, you know, water jug and back, something, but anything to basically break up that pattern of sedentary behavior. Because what you're telling your body if you get up every hour is, hey, you know what? I'm still using these muscles. I don't need my metabolism to slow down. Um, I am still staying active uh, throughout the day in, in smaller chunks. All right. So your body will see that and you know, you're less likely to have this atrophy and, and, and loss of muscle mass occur. <clears throat> so this is going to become very important when we start getting to uh, scenarios of fatigue from some of the uh, side effects from things like uh, radiation therapy and uh, hormone therapy. And now that's the recommendation. Number one, we want to move more and we want to sit less, all right? Now, a big question that I get with a lot of patients coming into the clinic is, uh, Nick, why do I even need to exercise, right? I'm coming to this clinic. The reason I'm here is because my doc uh, uh, referred me, but I don't really see the, the, the benefit in it, right? So let's look at the first point here. The leading cause of death in men with prostate cancer is cardiovascular disease, all right? So if we're looking at prostate cancer, um, long-term prostate cancer survival rates is looking pretty good, right? But if we catch it early, uh, based on a lot of the research uh, that was done 15, 20 years ago, um, we catch it early, we put you on the right treatments, your long-term prognosis and surviving prostate cancer looks pretty good, all right? What we know as a fact, though, uh, what's the number one killer here in North America? It's heart disease, right? And the older uh, an individual gets, the higher their risk. And just being a male right off the bat, you are at a higher risk of developing heart, heart disease in your later years. So we want to manage some of those side effects. Um, so when it comes to exercise, it can absolutely help mitigate some of those risk factors that contribute to you developing cardiovascular disease. Now, exercise uh, can also reduce and manage the adverse side effects of prostate cancer treatments. We're going to get into this a lot more later on in this, uh, in this presentation today. But basically, some of the big ones we see like fatigue, um, muscle mass loss, uh, weight gain, um, mood issues, 
uh, a lot of this stuff can be combated by getting onto a regular exercise uh, regimen. Okay. And finally, exercise is the most effective and evidence-based non-pharmaceutical intervention for prostate cancer patients. So when I give this talk um, in person, I'll ask, you know, the audience, how many of you like taking medication show, by a show of hands? And, you know, obviously most people's hands don't go up. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, you know, if you don't want to be on more medication, why would you want to, right? So if you're looking for that natural remedy to help, um, as a non-pharmaceutical intervention, uh, exercise is going to be your best bet. Now, the, some of the benefits of exercise, uh, it's been shown to improve cardiovascular health, bone density, you know, things like sleep, sexual function, body composition, blood sugar control, uh, flexibility and balance, uh, as well as uh, mental health. So a lot of benefits I'm sure you've known about, um, but it's a matter of putting the stuff into practice uh, on a regular basis to really start seeing some of these um, effects uh, take shape in the body. Now, how much exercise is recommended? This is probably the biggest question I get in the clinic is, okay, well, Nick, you know, I, I know about exercise and I used to do it when I was younger in high school or, you know, playing in college, but based on my age now, and I'm not trying to be no bodybuilder, what should I be doing? Right. And it's a really good question. So we can break exercise up into four tiers here. We have aerobic exercise training, resistance training, flexibility training, uh, as well as balance. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into each of them. All right. But before we do, uh, I wanted to go over this principle known as the FIT principle. All right. And this is a, a, a principle that we use as a clinical exercise physiologist when it comes to our exercise prescription in all four of those areas. Okay. So I want you to ask yourself some of these questions as we go through this. So frequency. How often right now are you performing exercise, right? And that can be anything. How often are you performing aerobic exercise, maybe balance, stretching, um, resistance training, right? Are you doing once a week? Are you doing, uh, you know, cardio every day? Ask yourself that question because we're going to come back to this and, and there are specific numbers we want for each of these. How about intensity? How hard do you push yourself on exercise? Do you get really out of breath? Um, you know, are you able to maintain it for two, three hours? No problem. Um, you know, can you still talk when you're doing exercise? So, you know, ask yourself that question. How about time? How much time do you spend exercising uh, per day, per week, right? Is it, you know, two minutes at a time, three times a day? Is it 10 minutes at a time, three times a day? Do you go for like an hour walk daily? How much time do you spend doing exercise? And finally, type of exercise. So what do you consider exercise? Is golf considered exercise? Is gardening considered exercise? Is going for a 20, 30 minute run or cycle considered exercise. So again, as the presentation goes on, we're going to uh, define these for each one of those four uh, pillars of exercise. All right. So let's start off with aerobic exercise. <clears throat> so when it comes to aerobic exercise training, what are some examples we're talking about here? First of all, so when it comes to aerobic, we're talking about things like, you know, using gym equipment, uh, cardio gym equipment, like the elliptical, the treadmill, the spin bike. It can be something like going for a, a walk uh, or a jog. It can be cycling on the road. It can be dancing. So those all come into the category of aerobic training. However, there are specific guidelines we want for this. So Health Canada uh, promotes at least 150 minutes uh, uh, per week of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise. So we're going to define moderate to vigorous intensity uh, in a couple slides here. But basically, we want to get 150 minutes of cardio in per week. All right, so it does seem like a pretty big number, but let's break that down a little bit. So if we take 150, and we break it down to 30 minutes a day, five days a week, okay, a little bit more manageable. Let's break that 30 minutes down a little bit more. So you can take that 30 minutes and break it down into three 10 minute bouts a day. So 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes in the evening. You could even go 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. You're still getting up to your 30 minutes for that day. All right. So however you want to break it up, totally up to you. If you're someone that's just starting out, I do recommend the lower caliber, you know, 10 to 15 minutes at a time. If you're someone that's been doing exercise for, you know, quite some time, then, you know, 30 plus minutes at a time. Now, I don't like going less than 10 minutes. Um, a lot of the research is showing, you know, at that 10 minute mark or more consecutively is when we start to see some of the benefits. But if you're someone that's coming in, that's very deconditioned, has, you know, uh, any sort of musculoskeletal issues, um, any sort of lung issues, and it, you're prevented from being able to maintain 10 minutes uh, in a row, then uh, yeah, we're going to start a little bit lower, right? Maybe five minutes and just continue to build off of that week by week. But the goal is to get to 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise per week. How about resistance training? So when we talk about resistance training, we're talking about like 
uh, things like, uh, you know, lifting weights, right? Uh, either using dumbbells, resistance bands, uh, maybe your own body weight, uh, TRX, kettlebell, machines in the gym. So there's plenty of different examples that we can do. Um, and we're doing resistance training and then it attempts to use some sort of external load, um, even, you know, using your own body weight, if you have to, um, in order to make um, strength gains um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, increasing muscle size um, or um, muscular endurance. Okay. So our goal here is to target the major muscles of the body. Uh, and some of these include the chest, the back, the legs, the core, uh, the shoulders, and we want to be targeting more functional movements, which are more multi-joint exercises, which again, we'll go over as the presentation goes on here so that we can address those major muscles. So we want to try to do resistance training at least twice per week. Um, and the reason uh, we, we do it uh, twice per week is because we don't want to do resistance training every day on the same muscle groups, because when we do resistance training, we tear the muscles down to a higher degree and they do require a little bit more time for recovery. So when we do resistance training, we want to give at least a day in between a workout. So maybe you do like a Monday, Wednesday, maybe you do like a Monday and a Thursday, but those recovery days are very beneficial. And then as you get more um, accustomed to doing uh, resistance training, then you can consider adding in maybe even a third or fourth day. Um, maybe you start doing an upper body and a lower body split. That way your upper body recovers on the day you're doing lower body workouts. But again, these are some specifics that we can talk about um, when you do come into the exercise clinic. All right, how about flexibility? So when it comes to flexibility, we know that as we get older, the body tends to get stiffer, right? Um, this is another time where I'll throw it out to be honest. You know, how many of you have uh, ever experienced uh, any sort of pain in your body, neck pain, low back pain, shoulder pain, um, you know, hip pain? A lot of the times these things are, are uh, uh, a cause of just poor mechanics, poor posture, and very stiff muscles around a joint. And if we can just start adding in some flexibility and stretching exercises, um, some of the stuff and a lot of the stuff can actually be overcome, right? And, and, but we need to do it in a, in a safe and manageable way where it's not going to cause any more harm. Uh, so when it comes to stretching, the recommendation is stretching on days that you perform exercise, uh, ideally most days of the week, okay? It can be you know, a full body stretch routine. It can be uh, something like yoga, um, but what we want to get across here is when we do stretching, our goal is to lengthen that muscle back out. So we overcome some of that stiffness that we do see as individual ages. And if we don't address this stiffness, then eventually down the road, we're increasing our chances of injury. Okay. So, uh, the best times to perform stretching are, um, after a workout. Okay. Uh, or I also rec recommend after uh, having a warm shower. And the reason uh, it's best after these two times is because your muscles are warm right? And when you have a warm muscle, they have a higher likelihood of stretching out. Okay. So that's usually when I recommend it. Now I do have patients saying, Hey, well, Nick, you know, I stretch first thing in the morning. Uh, can I continue doing that? The answer is yes. I mean, if your body's gotten accustomed to doing that, um, not a problem. I know people that wake up and, you know, do yoga first thing in the morning, but if you're someone that's brand new, your body's not used to it. And you try to stretch first thing, your muscles are cold. They're a lot tighter and your risk of injury does go up. Now, am I saying you're going to get injured hundred percent? No, but again, if your body's not trained to do uh, performing some of the stretching all the time, then, um, you know, your likelihood can go up. So I'd much rather you try doing uh, performing stretching um, after a workout uh, or after uh, getting out of like a warm shot. Okay. Uh, balance is another high area of um, uh, recommendation that we um, encourage in the clinic. And so we know that as an individual ages, um, uh, balance does become a little bit more of an issue. Um, we know that if you take a fall uh, and, you know, end up breaking a hip or, or fracturing a hip, it can set you back a very long way, you know, six, eight, 10 months. Uh, and that can be very debilitating both physically and mentally. So we encourage you to add in uh, balance exercises. Um, if you're someone that's at high risk of falling, if you have osteoporosis, if you're over the age of 65, um, generally speaking, balance is never a bad thing to add in. So this can be some of your typical, you know, single leg stand stuff. A narrowed stance. You can try using like a BOSU ball or standing on a pillow. Um, obviously having the correct support around you, a, a wall or a chair that you can hold on to if you feel like you're going to lose your balance. But this is one of those, uh, again, individualized situations, right? So if you do have questions or concerns about your balance, this is something that I would want to sit down with you and chat about um, and, and put a, a plan together for you. Okay. Now, a couple slides ago, I talked about aerobic exercise training, and we went over moderate and uh, vigorous intensity. So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into both of these. 
So let's first off start off with the moderate intensity. Okay. And even before I get into the intensity, what I want to go over was the exercise continuum. Okay. And um, so what the exercise continuum is, and we're going to get a better understanding of this in the next slide is uh, the three phases of exercise we go through. So when we start exercise, we have to have some sort of a warm up period. Okay. I wouldn't just ask you to get up off of this couch and go start doing sprints, right? I want you to adequately warm the body up, slowly get the heart rate and, and blood flow going, slowly increase your breathing rate and get the muscles ready for exercise, right? It's like a cold car. You don't just get in a cold car and start driving. You put a lot of wear and tear on that engine. Eventually it's going to start giving down out on you, right? Same thing with your body. You just get up and start running. You can put a lot of stress on that heart. And eventually, you know, it might start giving you some issues. So when we start exercise, we want to start with this gradual warm up period, you know, at a light pace. If we look at this um, scale here, this is a scale from one to 10, it's called the rating of perceived exertion, okay, the Borg scale. Now, one to two is considered easy, three to five is considered moderate, uh, seven to 10 is considered really hard. So when we're doing the warm up uh, for about 10 minutes, just to get the body going, it should be easy, okay? And easy is defined as you can sing a song or whistle, okay? So that's your initial 10 minutes of just getting the body going. After that 10 minutes, though, we need to start getting into a zone of pushing the body a little bit more, okay? If we stay in this light zone, you're not going to make any adaptations. Now, this next phase we call the conditioning phase. This is when we're actually starting to push the heart a little bit. So if we look at uh, example one here, uh, for moderate intensity, we see the talk test, okay? So what is the talk test? Basically, you can have a conversation when you're performing exercise. So if you're cycling, if you're dancing, if you're uh, you know, going for a run, if you're on an exercise piece of equipment in the gym, ask yourself right now, can I talk? If I had to say a full sentence before having a, to take a breath of air, I should be able to. If the answer is yes, great. You're in the moderate intensity zone. If the answer is, oh, you know what? I could probably still sing a song if I had to. You have room to push your intensity a little bit higher. Okay. If the answer is, oh yeah, you know, no, I can't. I'm like, I'm gasping for air. Now you're moving into the vigorous intensity zone, which we'll talk about uh, in a second. But generally speaking, at moderate intensity, you can have a conversation. Great. You're training at about 60 to 70% of your heart rate maximum. Next uh, part of uh, the moderate intensity zone is on this rating of perceived exertion scale. Um, how, so the RPE scale, like I was talking about a little bit earlier, is a scale of how hard does the exercise feel for you? Okay, if you had to scale it from uh, one to 10. So again, the one to two is easy. You can sing a song uh, or whistle. The three to five is moderate. You can talk. The seven to 10 is it's hard. Okay, you can maybe only say one or two words. If not, you're already you know, gasping for air a little bit. Now, when it comes to um, uh, the modern intensity zone, we want to be in that three to five out of a 10. Okay, if you're like, if, if I had to come up to you and say, you know, how hard do you find this for yourself right now? And you're like, oh, it's about a four or five, you're in the moderate intensity zone. Okay. Uh, again, if you're at the one or two, it's, you're easy. You, you have room to push a little bit more. Uh, and finally, uh, heart rate. Okay. So we have patients uh, that like the quantitative values uh, and they like having their heart rate um, calculated. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of this. So I'll tell you why in a second. But if you were to calculate your target heart rate, uh, I like using the 220 minus age formula. So you take 220 minus your age. So for example purposes, let's say we take a 20 year old, 220 minus 20, we get 200. Okay. We take that 200 multiplied by 0.6 or, or 0.5 rather, we get a number. And then we take that 200 and we multiply it by 0.7 and we get a number. Okay. So that's 50 to 70% of your age predicted maximum. Okay. So that right there gives you a target heart rate range. Now, the reason I don't like this is, well, there's a few reasons. One, if you're on a medication that suppresses heart rate, like a beta blocker, this won't even apply because you're not going to be able to get your heart rate that high in the first place. The second reason I don't like this is if you're someone that's a very conditioned, okay? If you're someone that, you know, goes for regular runs, you, you have great exercise capacity for your age, you're not even going to be able to get it nearly as high as, you know, someone uh, else your age in that uh, age predicted category. And on the other end, what if you're someone that's very deconditioned? Okay. So you just get out off the couch and you start walking and boom, your heart rate kind of skyrockets because, you know, used to exercising. Again, it's not going to really apply to you for your specific age. So I would much rather go off of the talk test and the RPE scale. The only real way to get a target heart rate range is if you did a stress test where we hook you up to ECGs, we, we have you hooked up to a monitor that's looking at your heart rate and rhythm. And then we basically exercise and stress you to maximum capacity on the treadmill uh, until you can't go anymore. And then using your resting heart rate and your max heart rate, we put into what we call the Carbonin formula and we calculate 
a target heart rate for you. But in this clinic, we don't do that. So ideally, going off the talk test and RP is, is usually my first bet, okay? So that's moderate intensity zone. That's where I, generally speaking, prescribe most clients because it's able, you're able to tolerate that a little bit, right? If you think back to times you've exercised, if you can still maintain a conversation, we're in pretty good shape, right? If you're starting to get to the zone where you're gasping for air, it gets a little bit harder and, and there's a little bit more uh, experience required to get into that zone. And that's where the vigorous intensity comes in. So let's define vigorous intensity. So vigorous intensity, you cannot say more than a few words during activity. Okay. So think about the last time you got, you were in that situation. Maybe you're trying to run to catch a bus or, you know, maybe you're running late for an appointment. You're really pushing your body. That's kind of the vigorous intensity zone. Okay. RPE seven to eight out of 10. So you're in that hard zone now. Okay. Max heart rate. You're training at 70 to 85% of your maximum. All right. So vigorous intensity, obviously a lot more challenging and obviously a lot more stressful in the body. So more participants don't like being in the zone because it's harder to tolerate. Now, is there a time and place? Yes. I mean, if you're someone that's used to exercising um, and, you know, we have different protocols, <clears throat> we'll put you in the vigorous intensity zone. Um, but a lot of the times we do start in the moderate, have patients get comfortable with that. And then we start engaging into the vigorous intensity zone. Now, there is a safe way we can get patients in the vigorous intensity zone. And I like using what we call um, uh, interval training. So interval training, uh, let's, uh, for example, let's take walking. So you go through your warm up for about 10 minutes. After your 10 minutes of warm up, you get into these intervals. So you do 30 seconds of fast walking, power walking to the point where you can only say one or two words, followed by one minute of recovery of, of walking, where you can you know, sing a song or whistle if you had to. After that one minute's up, you do 30 seconds of power walk again. You can only say two words, followed by a one minute recovery of, again, you can sing a song or whistle when you're walking if you had to. And you go back and forth like this for a period of about 20 minutes. Once the 20 minutes is done, you're done the interval training. You can continue with your regular walking or that might be your exercise bout for the day. Now, uh, this is great because, A, you, you, you get into the vigorous intensity zone, but you don't stay there too long, right? You, you stay there for a brief period of time, and then it's followed by a recovery. So it's a great way to stress the heart, build up aerobic capacity without necessarily overdoing it, okay? So if you're someone that's never exercised before, I'm not you know, prescribing you to go out and start vigorous exercise and doing this interval right away, maybe start in the moderate zone. And if you need a little bit more guidance, then this is something that you and I can talk about one-on-one um, -on -one in the clinic. Now, um, this is an important slide. And so this kind of summarizes that exercise um, continuum that uh, I was going over with you uh, in the previous slides, uh, previous slide rather. So we have the warm up. Again, you can see that we're gradually bringing heart rate up, okay? Getting breathing rating up, uh, rate up as well as warming the muscles up. That's about 10 to 15 minutes at that light pace, light meaning you can sing a song or whistle. After that, we get into the conditioning zone for at least 30 minutes. So this might be 30 minutes straight. This might be your you know, 10 minutes at a time, three times a day, however you want to do it. But this needs to be in a somewhat hard zone. Okay, So if you can still sing or whistle at this point, you do have room to push it harder. If you're in a place where you can talk, but you can't sing or whistle, perfect. You're in the moderate intensity zone. And if you're planning on getting to the vigorous zone, then you can push a little bit further than that, right? So we do that from anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, if not more. And then we finish off with the cool down. And I didn't touch on this the last slide, but basically when it comes to cool down, we want to bring everything back down to baseline. We want to gradually bring our heart rate back down, our breathing rate back down, our blood pressure back down. If you just finished a hard exercise session and went and sat down, there's no way of getting that blood back to your heart, right? So you do want to keep moving around a little bit. Um, it can be similar to what you did for the warm up, a light walk. Um, it can be uh, stretching you can uh, do uh, during this point. Now, any sort of movement that will keep the body moving uh, for a period of 10 to 15 minutes at that light pace again. Okay, And again, light is defined as you can sing a song or whistle. So that kind of summarizes the exercise continuum. And this is kind of the basic structure that we follow when we are um, performing exercise um, uh, most days of the week. Okay. Now, why do we uh, perform aerobic exercise training? So research shows that exercise can increase long-term survival. All types of exercise and physical activity enhance survival rates by up to 58%. Doing some vigorous exercise each week further lowers your risk of death from prostate cancer. And we see that increased aerobic fitness slowed prostate cancer progression as shown by increased PSA and doubling time. So uh, normally, if uh, we were doing this in person, I would ask you uh, uh, to fill out a questionnaire, you know, how much exercise are you currently doing? So you can, you can do this at home right now, right? Just ask yourself, how much exercise am I doing in the vigorous intensity zone, the moderate intensity zone, 
the mild intensity zone or that light zone where you could sing a song or whistle, and then how much resistance training are you currently performing? So if you do decide to um, uh, see myself uh, in the questionnaire, uh, or sorry, in the clinic, uh, we do have you fill out a questionnaire that has some of these questions on them. And uh, when <clears throat> before coming into the clinic, um, I have a quick overview of this. Um, and then uh, we can kind of have a general sense of what you're doing for exercise right now. So what about resistance training? So we spent a good chunk of time there talking about uh, aerobic exercise. How about resistance uh, exercise training? Now, when it comes to resistance training, uh, it is measured uh, in uh, a couple of uh, key terms here, sets, reps, and load. Okay, so let's go over each, each of these terms. So sets, uh, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll give you an example. So if you can see me in the picture here, um, let's say I'm going to be performing a shoulder press. So I have two weights beside me and I'm pushing the weights above my head and I'm lowering it down. Okay, so that's a shoulder press exercise. Press above my head and I lower them down. So I perform this movement 10 times. Okay, holding weights, I put those weights down. I wait a minute. Okay, after that minute's done, I grab those weights again and I perform another 10. So by me performing 10 of this movement, I, did, I performed 10 repetitions. Okay, this is my second time doing it though. So I'm on my second set or second group of 10. I do my 10, I put the weights down, I lift them up again, and now I'm, I'm on my third set of 10 repetitions. So my third group of performing this exercise 10 times. Okay, and I put those down. So Basically, sets is how many groups of repetitions you do. Reps is how many times do you execute the movement. So I, in that example, I did three sets of 10 repetitions. And load basically is how much weight you're using. So let's say, for example, I had 10 pound weights in my hand. So that would be considered the load. Okay. So it is recommended that you build up to two to four sets of eight to 12 repetitions. And, and normally in the clinic, that is uh, generally speaking where we prescribe exercise. We're in that two to four set of uh, eight to 10, uh, 12 rep zone because the eight to 12 reps, uh, we're really focusing on building up uh, muscular strength uh, as well as um, uh, increases in lean muscle mass. And that's the goal of a lot of the clients we work with in the clinic. Now, if you're someone that's never exercised and you're just looking to build up some habits with the routine, then yeah, we're going to start a little bit lighter uh, weight and maybe get you up to 15 reps, maybe 20 reps. So you get used to the movement, but we will eventually, you know, try to move you down to uh, that, uh, you know, eight to 12 rep zone so that we can build up some of our uh, muscle mass um, and uh, increase our strength, okay? So you are using the correct weight if at the end of the set, you cannot perform any more repetitions. So for example, let's say you came into the clinic and I prescribed uh, you to do two sets of uh, 10 repetitions to start, okay? You go home and you're performing the bicep curl exercise, you're doing it, you're at eight, nine, 10, but you're okay, no, I can do 11, 12, 13. Okay. That wasn't too bad. You put the weight down, you grab your weight again. Again, you're at nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay. I'm done at 12. So because you went over the prescribed requirement of two sets of 10, and you're actually doing two, uh, two sets of 12, that weight is too easy for you. Okay. You need to go up and wait. You should be, if I said two sets of 10, you should be at nine, 10, you're going for 11. You can't do 11. Okay. That's set number one. Same thing. Second set at nine, 10, you're going for 11. Again, you can't do 11. You put that weight down. Okay. So you need to be basically failing at that specific rep count uh, on each set that you're doing. On the other end, if you are, um, you know, only able to get to eight reps, but you're asked to do 10, the weight is too heavy for you. Okay. So in that situation, you can lower your weight a little bit because we want you to get to that 10 repetition. So if you're going over the required amount, Reduce, uh, you can increase your weight slightly. And if you're under the required amount, then you can uh, reduce your weight a little bit. Okay. So that's how you know you're uh, uh, performing the uh, exercise with the correct weight. Um, another thing I do see a lot of the times is um, when we perform exercise um, using a momentum, right? Or, or performing it too quickly. So if you use the two for two tempo, um, I find that this is very beneficial. And what that means is any exercise you do. So if I do the shoulder press, two seconds as I push up uh, above my head, two seconds as I lower down. Okay, if I'm doing a, a, a push up, two seconds as I push away from the wall or the ground, two seconds as I lower back down. Okay, bicep curl, right? Two seconds as I curl up, two seconds as I lower back down. If you follow that tempo, generally speaking, it's not fast, uh, too fast to start using momentum and you get full bang for your buck with the muscular contraction, Okay. Another thing um, that I wanted to go over is range of motion. So range of motion basically is taking that muscle through its entire function. So my shoulder, for example, the shoulder press exercise, my arm is involved in pushing straight above my head 
and then coming back down. That's my arm's full range of motion. If I just do this, you know, go halfway, I'm not executing the full movement and you're not getting the full contraction out of that muscle. So you want to make sure, again, you fully extend up, you fully extend down. Same thing with push up, right? If I go halfway, I'm not doing the full, full movement. You want to fully extend your arm and then, you know, fully lower yourself back down. Same thing with the bicep curl. I don't just go halfway, right? You want to all the way down and then all the way uh, to an extended arm position. You want to get the full concentric and eccentric uh, contraction. So we want to focus on full range of motion. And lastly, the thing I highlight the most is breathing. Okay. A lot of the times we perform what we call the Valsalva maneuver, especially if we're brand new, you know, you're lifting something, you're holding your breath, your face is turning bright red, your eyes are going to pop out of your uh, eye sockets. Um, we don't want that to happen, right? So make sure you breathe, especially for your patients that are diagnosed with hypertension. Um, and so at the beginning, just breathe. I know there's, there is a correct way to breathe with exercise, but just start with breathing because then you're thinking about too much. And uh, once you start breathing, um, then you can start reeling the correct way to breathe. So we want to breathe out on the exertion and we want to breathe in on the um, kind of the recovery phase of the um, exercise. So for example, when we're pressing above our head, we're exerting on the pushing up, up. So we breathe out and we breathe in as we lower the weight. Okay. When we're doing push ups, we breathe out as we push away from the ground to the wall. That's when we're exerting. We're breathing in as we lower ourselves down. Okay. Bicep curl, breathing out as you're lifting that weight up towards the shoulder breathing in as we lower that weight back down. Okay. And one more thing I do want to address is making sure that you're giving time in between sets. If you're doing, you know, two, three, up to four sets, don't just do a set, take 10 seconds and jump right back into it. Right. You want to make sure that you're giving yourself, um, adequate recovery and rest in between sets so that your muscles can, uh, recover neurologically and get prepared for the next set because if you just jump into it right away then um, you're not going to be able to do the required set uh, or rep rep count for that set and uh, you know you're just going to get fatigued a lot quicker and your, your risk of injury actually does go up okay so give yourself that correct time in between sets so that you can um, uh, um, have the proper recovery and, and not injure yourself now when it comes to exercise you know i, I have a very wide clientele uh, that we do see here in the clinic, some patients that have never stepped foot in a gym, some patients that have been exercising for 30 plus years, running marathons, cycling, um, which is great, right? But the last thing we want to do is uh, discourage anyone coming into the clinic that has never stepped foot in a gym or never exercised, right? Because, uh, you know, they might have that, uh, or you might have that uh, preconceived notion that, hey, you know, I, I can't do a, a regular push up off the ground or a squat or a plank. And, um, you know, maybe this exercise thing is not going to be for me. And that can be further from the truth. Every exercise we do uh, in the clinic, um, we can modify. So let's show you a couple examples here. So we have the chair squat exercise to start with, right? So if you're someone that's never exercised, something as simple as getting out of a chair, maybe you need to push up off the leg or your legs or use the armrest. That's totally fine. Eventually, maybe your next step is not using your hands at all. Perfect. You do that for a couple of weeks. Now it's Let's move the chair back and just have you come down and have your bum touch the chair and stand up. Okay, perfect. And then eventually we move you to not having to use the chair at all. All right. Um, for the push up, same thing. If, you're, if you've never done a push up in your life, I'm not going to get you on the ground and doing push ups right away. Again, you're going to just set yourself up for failure. So we start at the wall, you do your push up. Okay. Once you get comfortable with that, we maybe uh, we'll move you to a chair or a countertop. Uh, right, it, it, it lowers your angle a little bit, and then eventually we get you to the ground or the most resistance. Maybe starting off your knees first, uh, and then eventually moving to your toes. And then the same thing with the plank. We don't get you on the ground right away. Start you on a wall, hold for time, maybe fifteen to thirty seconds, maybe less if we need to start there. And then we move you to a chair, plank off of a chair, and then finally we get you off uh, of the ground, starting with your knees and then eventually move you over to your toes. So there's always progression for every exercise. If you have any limitations because of injury, uh, then we can always work around that as well. So the goal is not to look like this gentleman here, right? We're, we're not trying to be bodybuilders here. We're not trying to build mounds and mounds of muscle. Uh, the goal is actually functionality, right? <clears throat> A lot of you come into this clinic now, you know, you're getting into your later years. Um, we want to focus on independence, right? You want to be able to rely on yourself for doing things like carrying groceries, right? Being able to get out of a chair, walking upstairs, uh, playing with your grandkids, right? These are kind of the, the goals that we do see as individuals age. And so we want to be doing exercises and prescribing exercises to make things like this possible. Now, 
specific exercise prescriptions to manage and reduce treatment related side effects. That's kind of what we're going to get into next year. All right. So the first thing is urinary incontinence uh, and, and speaking on the pelvic floor exercises to help imp uh, improve continence. So research shows that pelvic floor Kegel exercises improve the condition of the muscular sling, thus improving control and function of the bladder. Okay. So we perform what we call the pelvic floor exercise in order to make this happen. Now, the benefits of this include possible quicker return to continence post-surgery, meeting physical activity guidelines pre-surgery uh, will result in uh, less incontinence post-surgery. So if you're someone that knows that you're going to be going in and potentially having a prostatectomy, um, another situation where we see incontinence uh, happen is uh, uh, after radiation or during radiation therapy. Uh, if you know you're going to be in those situations, then looking into um, the pelvic floor module uh, won't be a bad idea. If you're someone that's currently dealing with um, uh, incontinence issues and you do need a little, a little bit of extra support, then that pelvic floor module will also uh, be very beneficial for you. Okay, so understanding this technique, knowing how to contract the pelvic floor um, uh, muscle uh, is very helpful in reducing incontinence and getting you back to um, continence um, post-surgery or post-radiation uh, therapy uh, a lot quicker, okay? Uh, how about fatigue? So it, it is estimated that over 80% of cancer patients experience fatigue at some point. If you adopt a rest strategy, you will increase your fatigue levels. So aerobic and resistance exercises have been shown to be the most effective management strategy for fatigue when correctly prescribed, more effective than medication. And to enhance energy, exercise regularly, daily, in manageable doses, and build up your volume and intensity slowly. Now, if we go back to um, that slide earlier where we had those two examples of um, uh, Sarah's day and uh, Mike's day, right? We had one example of, of Sarah not doing a whole lot of movement throughout the day and uh, Mike adding in those exercise breaks every hour throughout the day. And so this becomes very important for patients that are trying to combat fatigue, right? If we go back to that same principle of that rest strategy uh, and not moving and, you know, you're really tired that day, you've just come off a bottle of radiation and you don't feel like you, you want to do anything, you just want to lay in bed your body will start to adapt to this, right? Basically, it'll say again, hey, you know, you're not using these muscles, um, you know, this cardio will the capacity that we built up for you. Um, you're not really doing anything with it. So you're going to start to have that atrophy happen again, right? And so when that happens, then the fatigue will actually get amplified. So contrary to popular belief, adding in a little bit of movement will be beneficial. So I'm not saying, you know, go try to run marathons or go for your regular walk that you would normally do. But Try adding in those small bits throughout the day. Remember those bite-sized pieces. If you can barely get out of bed, maybe it's going to be something as simple as just sitting up on the side of your bed, standing up, and then you know laying back down five times every hour. Maybe it's going to just be a two, three-minute hallway walk that day every hour. But the more you can add in these small bits throughout the day, the more of a compounding effect it will have. It won't make a, a real difference if you just do it once or twice. But if you're trying to do this you know, hourly throughout the day, you can start to see these um, uh, small uh, bits of effort uh, add up and you will start to, um, you know, notice a little bit of a difference with your fatigue if you st uh, stay very um, uh, diligent with this. Okay. Uh, but again, we do understand that, uh, you know, you're the one going through the fatigue and no one really knows uh, to what degree you're feeling it. Right. So there are strategies around this. So some of these may include things like exercising earlier in the day, morning versus the nighttime, because your energy is a little bit higher in the morning. So, you know, waking up, maybe having breakfast and trying to go through your exercise belt then um, <clears throat> after, you know, properly digesting and whatnot, um, or maybe, you know, later, uh, later in the morning, you can try that out. Uh, break exercise into smaller bouts. So three by uh, 10 minute bouts a day. And so instead of doing 30 minutes in a row, break it up into smaller chunks, reduce your walking time, excuse me, for that day. So maybe um, instead of doing a 60 minute walk like you're used to, uh, reduce your pace and, and, and maybe you're doing a 20 minute walk instead uh, for those couple of days when your energy level is a little bit lower. Um, trying to get up every hour and walking around. So we've gone over this many times now, adding those exercise breaks, whether it means setting a timer or, or just you know knowing that uh, every hour on the hour, you're trying to get up and, and uh, move around for a couple of minutes. Taking exercise breaks during commercials on TV. Uh, for example, maybe doing 10 squats or 10 wall push-ups, that will help out. Um, and there is a time and place uh, where you might have done too much. And I did want to address this part. So when you exercise, let's say, for example, you exercise on a Monday, the Tuesday and, and most likely on the Wednesday, you'll probably be even a little bit more sore. 
but by the Thursday, that soreness will start to recover. Okay. And so this is known as the DOMS effect, delayed onset of muscle soreness, where your body's broken down muscle tissue. It's in the recovery phase. And with the proper rest, proper nutrition, that muscle is able to rebuild and come back a little bit stronger. Okay. So exercise Monday, Tuesday, you're sore. Wednesday, you're a little bit more sore. By Thursday, that soreness is going away. Now, if you're someone that, you know, you exercise on the Monday, immediately after you exercise, you're wiped out, you're bed bound, you can't do your day-to-day -day activity. You did too much, okay? If you exercise on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, can't do your day-to-day your -day stuff, you're, again, super fatigued, super exhausted, you did too much, all right? If that's the situation, you need to be talking with your exercise physiologist to tweak your program a bit. Um, and, and not do as much. Uh, if you can't complete your, your activities of daily living, like we had gone over um, in that previous example, uh, then again, you've done too much, all right? So if that's the case, we need to speak with your exercise professional. How can we manage our exercise program a little bit better? And then, uh, you know, try troubleshooting from there, okay? Uh, how can exercise help with body composition? So we know that uh, with hormone th therapy, ADT, uh, we see an increase in body fat, approximately 10%, and a reduction in muscle mass, approximately 4% during the initial 12 months. So <clears throat> a reduction of muscle mass can reduce musculoskeletal fitness, which can compromise muscle strength and physical function. So here's the thing. We know that um, you, you kind of peak at your strength at around 30 years old. And then after that age, we start to see a, a little bit of a decline. A st not a huge decline, but a, a slow decline after 30. Okay, into your 40s, 50s, once you reach kind of your 60s and 70s, that decline starts to happen at a, at a bit of a faster rate. All right. So, uh, and the reasoning for this is just a natural decrease in uh, testosterone. Now, if, um, if you take that uh, individual, for example, someone in their 70s who's already starting to have their muscle mass uh, reduce at a quicker rate, um, plus you add on this hormone therapy, you're going to start to see an amplified effect of a loss of muscle mass and a loss of strength, okay? So uh, can we avoid this, you know, gradual loss in strength over time? No, especially in our later years, but we can significantly reduce the rate at which it goes down. And the best way to do this is gonna be resistance training, okay? So we know that exercise, especially resistance training, can preserve lean body mass, muscle, strength, and function, and prevent gains in fat mass. So when I work with patients that are on hormone therapy, the number one thing we do implement is some sort of resistance training program to help um, uh, reduce the uh, impacts of hormone therapy on muscle mass. All right. So having a properly structured exercise program, specifically with strength training, is going to be very, very beneficial for this group, not only with strength training, but also that increase in fat mass, because we know that if we increase fat mass, usually it's around the stomach area for, for most guys. If that area increases in fat mass, your cholesterol can go up, your, you know, uh, blood sugar sensitivity uh, can increase or decrease rather your insulin uh, you become more insulin insensitive and your risk of diabetes can go up um, your blood pressure can potentially increase so these are things that can lead to cardiovascular disease right so exercise is one piece of the puzzle um, but another rat natural route we can talk about is um, uh, nutrition right so i do highly encourage patients that are on hormone therapy you know any patient coming to the clinic for that regard but um, specifically this group because we know that fat mass can increase. Um, you should be speaking with our program dietitian if you choose to. Um, it's, it's a great resource to uh, go over what uh, foods um, maybe you should be eliminating from the diet or what foods that you should be encouraged to eat a little bit more so that we don't see as much of this weight gain happen. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, so exercise can also help uh, minimize bone loss. We know um, osteoporosis is a potential risk for patients that are on long term uh, hormone therapy. So osteoporosis is the loss of bone tissue leading to brittle and fragile bones. So we see a normal bone here on the left, and we can see a, a more porous bone here on the right with, that has more holes between them, right? And that porous bone, a bone rather, um, is um, uh, basically a reduction in bone mass leading to an increased risk of fracture and associated disability, all right? So bone density is lower for men on ADT and reduces the longer that ADT treatment um, does go on, like I was mentioning earlier. So performing things like aerobic resistance and impact exercises can help to build bone mass, improve bone structure, reduce bone loss, and prevent falls. So if we're talking about just exercise in general, 
Um, you know, you put that bit of stress on your bone when you're performing different exercises, you know, walking, running, uh, using the elliptical, cycling, uh, doing resistance training, that will, uh, you know, force the bone to, to rebuild to a degree, right? Uh, performing things like impact exercises can help. So when we talk about impact exercises, we're talking about things like, you know, marching on the spot, maybe skipping a uh, rope, uh, you know, doing jumps on the spot, single leg, double leg, box jumps. So these higher impact exercises, because of that increase in impact, can have a higher degree of, of rebuilding or remodeling of the bone to have them come back stronger. Now, if you're someone that's never done impact exercises before, I would not you know, recommend you do them right out of the gate, um, <clears throat> especially if you are someone that is uh, at risk of developing osteoporosis. I would much rather sit down with you and see you know, to what degree is your bone uh, mineral density. And if it's you know, uh, on the end where your fracture risk is increased, then yeah, we're not going to start with jumps and whatnot, right? We might start with some resistance training, some you know, light marching, and then we can build up from there. But the last thing we want to do is have you perform any sort of exercises and you are, uh, do have osteoporosis and uh, you injure yourself, okay? So rather than you know, trying to decide what exercise to do on your own, um, again, sitting down with uh, an exercise professional that has this sort of um, knowledge or expertise would be uh, beneficial for you. Um, exercise can help with sexual health and libido. So we know uh, that sexual activity and uh, libido will normally decrease post-surgery. Uh, so that's after having a prostatectomy and during and after hormone treatment. So there are some studies out there now that show a three-month group-based resistance training and aerobic exercise program can maintain sexual activity, increase libido, and increase feelings of masculinity. So it's just something about, you know, a guy getting in the gym and, and you know, they are still looking into this a little bit more, but it's having a guy get into the gym uh, and lift weights that has an impact on the libido. Now, are we saying that just doing exercise alone will, you know, get your libido right back to where it was before? Uh, no, we're not saying that, right? But it does have a degree of, of an effect. Uh, however, th if this is a serious area of focus for you and you are looking at improving uh, your, your sexual health and your libido, then um, the sexual health module um, is a phenomenal module for you to, uh, to look into. That's specifically what they talk about. Um, and you can uh, talk with our sexual health nurse um, in ways to um, uh, improve on that. Okay. Some other side effects uh, from uh, the different treatments include uh, hot flashes. So this one's in particular to uh, hormone treatment. So 80% of patients on ADT experience hot flashes. This is something that you're really struggling with, uh, sitting down with um, our nurse practitioner in the program, uh, or even looking into the uh, hormone therapy module on ways to uh, combat this would be uh, uh, beneficial for you. Uh, mental health issues uh, may arise. So decreased mental health is common in prostate cancer patients as well as uh, quality of life. So most patients will experience changes in quality of life. Um, and, you know, as guys, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty bad about talking about some of this stuff. We feel that, you know, if, if any of this stuff ends up uh, arising, uh, you know, having the stress, this anxiety, you know, this new diagnosis or not being able to control your bladder, noticing this weight increase, noticing this loss of muscle mass, having some of this mental fog or this um, fatigue show up, it can be very debilitating, um, you know, mentally and physically. And you might have family members and, and uh, friends um, are trying to support you, but they just don't know what, exactly what's going on. So sitting down with a, a qualified professional is very beneficial. And, and, you know, the worst thing we can do in these situations is just suppress it and hold it in, right? That just gives us more stress and anxiety. So at least talking it out, uh, this is where our um, counseling, um, uh, our clinical counselor uh, is, is, uh, comes in um, uh, very useful because they can sit down with you. They kind of know um, kind of the approach to, to, um, uh, speak with you on. And, uh, after a session, if you feel like you, you got the information that you needed and you can continue on, but, um, that's kind of a decision that you can make for yourself. Uh, even if you, uh, you know, are still hesitant, you can always check out the uh, counseling module and, uh, they can provide a little bit more information to you that way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have the, um, but we also see bone metastases and advanced cancer, uh, in some patients. So exercise can be safe when prescribed, correctly. Uh, in this situation, I would recommend seeing a exercise physiologist. And the reason for that is we don't want to run the risk of injury, right? There might be certain movements and exercises that we need to be avoiding. And so working with a trained professional uh, is very beneficial. Um, another thing we may see is peripheral neuropathy. So this can occur after uh, chemotherapy, where you have a slight loss of sensation in areas like your hands and in your feet. 
Uh, and so, you know, there are some stuff we can do balance wise um, to help uh, correct this a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's more of a neural issue. So if you are struggling with this, speaking with your um, uh, doctor uh, would be uh, useful. And uh, lymphedema, this may occur after uh, lymph node removal and radiation therapy. So this is uh, generally speaking, some swelling seen in the lower half and the uh, legs usually. And uh, if you're noticing this happen, again, speaking with your doctor, they may prescribe you to, you know, elevate your feet, wear compression stockings. Um, but you do want to address this with your doctor to uh, see what approach that they want to take. So choose the exercise that will specifically reduce and manage the side effects of your prostate cancer treatments and response to treatment. So this is, again, where an exercise plan is very useful, depending on what treatment you're on, whether it's radiation, you've had a prostatectomy done, you're on hormone treatment. Um, chemotherapy, you might be on a combination of a few of those, which exercises can you do to combat these side effects and sitting down with an exercise professional um, to discuss these exercises uh, can be very useful. So how do we begin exercise safely? Now, again, after today's talk, if, you've, um, if you are interested in, in doing exercise, um, but you plan on doing it on your own, I would highly encourage you to speak with your, uh, your doctor because I don't know your history I know I went over a lot of different guidelines here today, but you might have some other underlying health issues that may prevent certain movements and exercises. So speaking with your doctor before starting exercise um, would be recommended. Uh, Post-surgery and treatment. So when is it safe to exercise? If you're someone that's had, uh, let's say, a prostatectomy done, uh, we don't just you know, have the surgery and get you exercising the next day, right? There is a recovery period. Now, uh, it's generally recommended that you don't do any heavy lifting more than 10 pounds over the first uh, six weeks. Um, we also, um, uh, you know, want to recommend exercise in slow, gradual bouts. So maybe, you know, the first couple of days, you're just doing some light walking around your house, nothing strenuous, a light pace where, you know, you could sing a song or whistle if you had to, um, maybe by day five to seven, um, you're going for a, a, a slow, a light walk outdoors, um, you know, for five, 10 minutes. And, you're, but the main thing I want to say here is you're always checking in with your body right? Um, how do you feel during the walk? How do you feel immediately after the walk? How are you feeling the next day? Are you in significant pain the day of, right? When you're walking uh, after 10 minutes, then maybe that 10 minutes is too much for you, right? Are you in significant pain after even the next day? Then again, maybe starting at 10 minutes was too much for you, or maybe it's just too early for you to start walking. Wait a couple of days, um, reduce your time to five minutes, see how that feels. Ask yourself those same questions. If you're like, okay, you know what? I, I feel okay. Then maybe after two, three days, you can add a couple minutes of walking onto your, um, onto your uh, routine. Okay. But that's kind of how we move in, in those slow progressive ways. And if you're really concerned about it, then again, talking with an exercise uh, professional would be beneficial. Uh, you want to see, uh, see a qualified exercise professional uh, to help safely guide you through an exercise plan. Uh, always include a warm up and a cool down that incorporates mild aerobic exercise and stretching. Start slowly and build slowly to avoid doing harm. So, for example, right, let's say you've been on the treadmill for a couple of weeks and you're ready to increase. You've been doing, you know, three miles an hour on a three percent incline. You don't just all of a sudden go to ten miles an hour on a three percent incline, right? That would just be setting yourself up for failure. Maybe instead of three and three, now you're going three point two miles and three percent. Okay, same thing with weights. After doing bicep curls using ten pounds. For a couple of weeks, you're ready to move up. Um, you don't go from 10 pounds to 20 pounds, right? So maybe the next step up will be using 12 pound dumbbells. And remember, some activity is better than none. So just getting a little bit of movement in throughout the day, even on those days when you don't feel like it or you feel really tired, those small bits of two to, you know, to three minutes every hour is going to help out. So consulting with a qualified exercise professional to safely guide you through exercise suitable for you and your situation. So like I said, um, if you are interested in working with an exercise professional, um, here are some of the accrediting bodies that um, we are certified under. We have the CSEP, Canadian Society of Exercise Physiologists, uh, Exercises Medicine Canada. Uh, I am um, uh, accredited through the American College of Sports Medicine, and we have the Physiotherapy Association of British Columbia. Now, all of these bodies, um, uh, you know, if you're working with someone that is accredited through these organizations, that they do have the knowledge. And that's basically what it comes down to, right? You want to work with uh, someone that knows the treatments that you've gone through, that knows uh, some of the, um, your medical history, some of the medications that you're taking, some of the limitations um, uh, that you, you know, might have with exercise, right? You might try start exercising on your own and you're doing, you know, like a shoulder press and you have metastases in your shoulder, um, and you're like, oh, yeah, you know what? It's just muscle pain. Um, but essentially, you're just doing more structural damage and you end up injuring yourself. 
those are the things we're trying to avoid, right? So rather than have that happen, you know, why not sit down with us, um, have a, you know, a, a discussion on what you should and should not be doing, take that um, knowledge and then apply it into your uh, workout routine. And that is, is a higher likelihood that you won't be uh, setting yourself up for failure and that you can uh, safely exercise, uh, performing an exercise routine. Now, one thing that we do spend some time talking about when you do come in the clinic are our exercise goals. And everyone has different goals when it does come to exercise. But one of the typical acronyms we use here in the clinic is uh, SMART goal. Okay, so one of the most common goals we get is uh, weight loss. You know, uh, Nick, I want to lose weight. Um, and I, I, I like that goal, but we want to make it a little bit more direct and specific and, and broken down into bite-sized pieces. So how do we make it a SMART goal here? So SMART, again, uh, it's an acronym, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and timely. So specific, what do you want to do? You want to lose weight. Great. Measurable, how much weight do you want to lose? Uh, you know what? I'm looking at losing about uh, 10 pounds, okay? Action-oriented, how are we going to lose that weight? Uh, my goal is I want to go into the gym um, three times a week. I want to do cardio for the first 30 minutes. Uh, sorry, I want to go to the gym three times a week for an hour. So I'm going to do cardio for the first 30 minutes, and then I'm going to do resistance training for the last 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, is it realistic? So do you really see yourself going to the gym three times a week, right? What if something comes up, you have to do babysitting or your, your friend Bob wants to go hang out. Um, what are you going to do, right? Do you have a buffer day? Is there a day on the weekend that you can potentially make up? And um, how about um, weight loss, right? You want to lose 10 pounds? How long? Do you want, in how long do you want to lose that weight loss? Is it going to be in a week, right? 10 pounds? That's not that realistic. Is it going to be over, you know, three months? That's a little bit more realistic, right? Generally speaking, when it comes to weight loss, we're looking at about a pound to two pounds um, uh, a week. So on the lower end, that'd be a pound uh, a week, four pounds uh, over the course of a month. Over the course of three months, we're looking at about 12 pounds. Okay, so timely then, how long are you looking at losing this um, uh, 10 pounds? Say over the course of a period of three months. So you just took the goal of, I want to lose weight to, I want to lose weight. Specifically, I want to lose uh, 10 pounds um, in a period of uh, three months, I'm going to do it by going to the gym three times a week for one hour per session. First 30 minutes, I'm going to spend doing cardio. And then the last 30 minutes, I'm going to spend doing resistance training. And if uh, a day in the week comes up where I can't work out, you know, either those Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, I have my buffer day on Saturday uh, to make up for that session. Okay. So just by breaking it down this way, you set yourself up for, uh, for success and uh, it's more of a manageable plan that you can work yourself through. Now, what are some of the next steps? So if you choose to, um, you can book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with myself, um, the exercise physiologist in the program, to see what we need to do specifically for you based on your treatments, based on your medical history, and then we can devise an exercise plan for you. Okay. Um, sometimes, especially for patients that are on uh, hormone therapy or ADT, they may be at greater risk for cardiovascular disease. Okay. And so if we see that things like their weights up, blood pressures up, um, you know, they're having a hard time with uh, some of their uh, profiles like cholesterol or blood sugar, then we may refer you over to a cardiac rehab program. Okay. Just, just for better management of those risk factors for potentially developing heart disease. Um, there's a uh, local community programs and companies like group uh, classes for prostate cancer survivors, prostate cancer, dragon boat teams, local exercise professionals. So there's a lot of great resources out there. We're going to go over the exercise classes here in, in a slide, but um, you know, there's a lot of gr groups out there that do uh, uh, chats, um, you know, get togethers and talks on um, patients that have gone through prostate cancer therapies. Uh, and there's patients there that have, have not gone through these therapies, but they have questions. So it's a great way to get these, um, uncertainties uh, answered and these questions answered. Um, and uh, there's also local exercise professionals out there that uh, run private practices that, um, that work with prostate cancer patients. Okay. So if you ever have any questions about any of these resources, you can always um, reach out to our clinic and we can provide that for you. Uh, there's HealthLink BC, uh, phoning 811. Now this is a free telephone service staffed by exercise physiologists. There's nurses, dietitians, um, exercise physiologists, um, and, and the exercise physiologist here is actually trained to work with uh, prostate cancer patients. So if you have a quick question um, regarding exercise, but you just don't know um, how to go about it, you can call this number and uh, the exercise physiologist can help you out. And uh, lastly, research studies, right? So in our prostate cancer uh, program here, um, we do take on research uh, initiatives. You got to remember that um, the research that was done 15, 20 years ago is what's uh, allowed us to make such great advances in prostate cancer 
uh, treatments um, at this point. And hopefully the research from today is able to help out the uh, prostate cancer uh, patients, you know, 15, 20 years down the road from, from now. Um, so if you are presented with the opportunity and you feel comfortable, definitely sign up for those studies. But again, it, it, it's all based on your comfort level. So if it's something you want to do, great. Uh, if it's not, then, um, you know, that's not a problem either. Now we spent uh, a, a brief period of time there talking about some of the um, initiatives outside of the program. And this exercise program is one of them. Um, it's called the Survivor uh, BC Exercise Program. And it's an exercise class that's designed specifically for uh, prostate cancer patients. Okay, so it's a six to 12 week exercise program consisting of two one hour sessions each week. Uh, it's designed to support men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and engaging in regular exercise. Uh, it focuses on strength development through resistance based training with activities for cardiovascular health, balance, and flexibility. And it's delivered by the BC Recreation and Parks Association fitness instructors in person outdoors or virtually through Zoom video conference. So uh, there's multiple locations out there, uh, physical locations. So if you do have a location near you, you can feel free to attend in person if you feel comfortable. Um, if there isn't a location by you, then you can always attend um, uh, via Zoom. Okay, so this is great because we have an instructor that leads the, the class um, over an hour. You, they take you through a warm up. they take you through uh, weight training, they take you through stretching and cool down at the end. Um, like I mentioned, the instructor puts the program together they look at you and they correct your forms uh, just to make sure that you're performing the exercise correctly. And uh, it's a great way to meet other uh, prostate cancer patients, right? So um, we all in this group together and, um, you know, you're going through exercise together. So it's a great way to keep yourselves uh, accountable and showing up to these uh, exercise classes. So if you did want some more information uh, about these, uh, you can reach out to our clinic. Uh, there's also the link below to, um, uh, to check out the, um, uh, the actual classes to get more information. Now, we spent some time talking about the FIT principle today, and this is just a quick summary slide of um, how many uh, you know, days a week, uh, what kind of intensity, uh, what kind of exercises, and uh, how much time you should be spending doing uh, these routines. All right? So if you look at the aerobic routine, uh, aerobic exercise, we have frequency we're aiming for most days of the week, intensity, uh, moderate to somewhat hard, or you can talk when exercising time at least 30 minutes or more. Again, if you need to break those up into smaller chunks, maybe 10 minutes bouts three times a day, maybe two 15 minute bouts, but trying to get to that 30 minutes most days of the week. Uh, and uh, walking, uh, running, cycling, swimming, these are all examples of aerobic exercise training. When it comes to resistance training, um, again, we're trying to aim for at least twice a week up to you know three times a week. Uh, intensity can be anywhere from eight to 10 exercises, two to four sets, eight to 12 reps per exercise. We're looking at a one minute rest in between those sets. Okay. So time-wise anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes and the type of exercise can be uh, body weight, dumbbells, resistance bands. So again, the time it's going to vary. If you're doing one set, it's going to be a little bit quicker. If you're doing two, three sets, it's going to take a little bit more time. Okay. Uh, flexibility. Um, again, this can be uh, done on most days where you perform exercise. Intensity should be light, right? You should be able to sing a song or whistle during this. It's not meant to be strenuous. You should be feeling a mild stretch, which is pain-free, uh, aiming for at least 10 to 15 minutes. And the type of uh, flexibility we're looking at here is full body stretch. Uh, you can perform yoga, whatever you feel comfortable with. And lastly is balance. So frequency here, one to two times a week. So you want to include more frequency if you are over the age of 65, have osteoporosis or your balance is poor, um, uh, and you just want to work on your balance overall. So intensity here, again, is light, um, RP of two time 10 to 15 minutes uh, for your routine and the type of exercises it can be anything right it can be single leg balance heel to toe uh, using a bosu ball or a pillow to make the um, you know surface a little bit unsteady uh, but if you do have some specific questions about any of these then sitting down with an exercise professional um, will be helpful for you at the end of the day we want to promote moving more and sitting less and so some of the next steps uh, would be if you are interested in coming uh, and doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, in the clinic, you can reach out to our program coordinator um, and book that appointment, okay? And then from there, we can go ahead and uh, sit down and um, uh, chat about what uh, specifics you need for your exercise program and um, going over some of your specific goals based on what treatments you're doing. Uh, and put that exercise plan together for you. I'd like to thank you for um, joining me in today's discussion. And uh, hopefully we get to um, sit down and uh, meet some of you one-on-one um, -on -one in the exercise clinic. 
you have a good day. Take care.